Well, welcome to session four of our class, The Questions of Jesus. Um, we had a bit of a problem last night, a uh, technical problem with the recording, so uh, didn't come up, which is um, a little too bad because we had some great interaction, but I apologize for that. But uh, I thought I would just go through the notes here um, with with you. So if you want to see that, and I've got Marcia here on off screen. There she is. She's peeking in there. She's, <laughs> she's going to be my scripture reader. So uh, anyway, um, we would like to talk about some, some questions related to Jesus healing. Um, and then we're, later in the, in the session, we'll shift and uh, look at a um, well-known miracle and a question that Jesus asked in the midst of that. Well, as an introduction, when you go to the doctor, one of the first things that he does, of course, is to ask questions. Questions like, what is your name? What's your age? Um, where does it hurt? How long has it hurt? Uh, and then the all important question, do you have insurance? Um, and once he gets some of these questions answered, he can then start dealing with your issue that you have. Healing was a huge part of Jesus' ministry. He was known as the great physician, and his healings often began with questions. To the demon-possessed, he asked, what is your name? To the son with seizures, he asked the father, how long has this been going on? To the blind man, after applying saliva to his eyes, do you see anything? So let's look at uh, the question he asked a man who had been an invalid for over 38 years. He asked him, do you want to get well? Imagine going to the doctor, getting all these questions. Uh, he answers them all, or you answer them all. And then he asked the final question. So do you want me to help you? That's how crazy this question is. Um, do you want to get well? Well, of course, seems, seems like a, Bizarre question, but let's look at some of the context. It was found in John 5, 1 through 9. So if you want to turn to that, John 5, 1 through 9. I've asked Marcia to read this. So she's going to jump in and do that. Marcia. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored cups five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, Someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. Thank you, Marcia. So in verse 2, uh, we see this Bethesda, uh, which is translated House of Mercy. Um, you may have heard of Bethesda Naval Hospital. Um, this pool is actually located to the north of the temple near the Sheep Gate. And the Sheep Gate is one of the gates that was repaired back in Ezra's time. Archaeologists have actually discovered this pool in the 19th century, so it's a pool that you can actually visit. Probably fed by springs, which caused the water to stir. Um, if you look at verse 4, in your Bible, uh, most translations don't have a verse four. It says four and then it goes right on to five. Um, and uh, if in your footnotes, you might see a reading of that. Um, it probably says uh, in your something like from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease that he had. Now, it's not in the earliest manuscripts, so scholars think that someone probably added it later. Uh, trying to be helpful to explain the story, 
which honestly it does. It helps us understand it. Um, it's a local tradition. First one in the pool, uh, when it's stirred, gets healed. Um, and even though it's not part of the text, it's certainly uh, something that the man um, believed. You see that in verse 7. Um, verse 5, Jesus chose one person to heal. Why this man? There must have been other people around in this pool waiting for the water to stir. Um, it, was, it was something that was, I'm sure, drew many people who had incurable conditions. Why this guy? We don't know. It's God's sovereign grace. Um, the verse doesn't tell us uh, his physical problem. Just an invalid. He can't get into the water. Maybe he's paralyzed. But his condition was helpless. He was beyond the doctor's help. And maybe that's why Jesus uh, chose him. Maybe he's like, I'm going to choose the toughest case. I don't know. But put yourself in his shoes. An invalid for 38 years. Who knows how long you've been coming to the pool with just this hope of being healed. He had no hope of getting to the pool first. He had, he'd said that no one could help him, but he still came. 38 years. Um, it's longer than the normal lifespan of that day. This guy is an older guy uh, who just must have been beaten down by life um, almost four decades of this condition. In verse 6, we get Jesus' question, do you want to get well? Think about the question that uh, Jesus could have asked, or maybe uh, a question that um, would have been common of, in that time. Something like, how did you get this way? Because people at that time uh, probably thought that someone with that kind of physical ailment was caused by their sin or maybe um, sin of their ancestors. So what sin did you or your parents commit that you would end up this way? But who would ask, so do you want to get well? It's crazy, seemingly crazy. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to plug in my computer because it's running out of power. There we go. Verse 7, the man thought that Jesus was talking about the pool. How else could he get healed? right? Note that he doesn't answer Jesus' question. Instead, he gives this list of reasons why he can't be healed. I'm alone. There's no one can help me. Someone always gets in there first. Everyone else has it better than me. I added that last one. Now, I don't want to overstate his case, but it seems like he was more comfortable in his disability than he uh, that he had come to know than to hope in something new, some kind of new reality. Um, his answer reflects frustration. He was a victim. There's no one to help. He was probably angry. Maybe he was just resigned. This is just the way it is. He doesn't directly answer Jesus' question, but obviously he wanted to get well because he kept showing up at this pool. Here we might see some semblance of faith. Um, maybe he wanted to get well, but he had no idea how to go about it. And he certainly didn't understand that Jesus had the power to heal. And then verse 8 and 9, the very thing that he cannot do, the very thing he's unable to do because of his disability, Jesus commanded him to do. Like I said, he doesn't show any overt faith. Um, Jesus doesn't say, do you want to get well? And he says, yes, Jesus, please heal me. Instead, he gives these excuses. Um, and that kind of leads me to think, um, is, isn't faith necessary to get healed? We had a great discussion on this uh, when we went through the class. And again, I apologize for not having that. Um, but I've always thought that Jesus... Um, chooses to heal people that show faith, um, that, that in a sense, uh, faith is necessary um, to get healed. Or better, doesn't Jesus look for faith before healing? Remember, um, remember in Nazareth, in his hometown, uh, he, there wasn't much faith there. 
Um, Matthew 15, 58 says, and Jesus did not do many miracles because of their lack of faith. Or when the, the friends lowered the paralytic to Jesus, it says that when Jesus saw their faith, he healed the man. In our next story, Jesus, Jesus says that your faith has made you well. But here we don't see any obvious show of faith. Maybe we can infer it, but it's not obvious. So is faith necessary? What would you say to that question? Since you can't answer, I'm just going to move on. But uh, in your mind, is faith necessary? Um, I guess we have to conclude that, that no, faith is not necessary. Jesus is not limited by our faith. Um, when Jesus healed the, Malchus's ear, um, that was when he was being arrested and Peter chops it off. Uh, Jesus picks up the ear and puts it back on and heals him. Obviously, Malchus didn't have any faith that that was going to happen. Um, the, um, sorry, I got lost here. Maybe the best way of saying the general rule is that Jesus heals as a result of our faith, as a, per, sorry, as a result of a person's faith, but he's not dependent on it. He's not limited by our faith. Well, back to Jesus' method of healing. His healings were always highly relational. He didn't perform mass healings. Uh, it was always one-on-one. -on -one. It wasn't like this conveyor belt. You're healed. You're healed. You're healed. Um, which, honestly, sometimes you see, you know, in some of the faith healings um, on TV and, and whatnot. But in Jesus' healings, it always involved relationship. When the blind man cries out to Jesus on the road to Jericho, Jesus asks, so what do you want me to do for you? Another seemingly ob obvious question. I mean, if you were blind, of course, you'd want to see. If you were an invalid, of course, you'd want to walk. But Jesus treats each person with dignity. Um, Martin Copehaver uh, shares an interesting quote um, that I want to share with you here so you can see it. It says, most of us have a tendency to assume that we know what another person needs or wants, particularly if that person is dealing with some kind of challenge or disability. But perhaps what the blind man wants, more than anything else in the world, is something other than the restoration of his sight. He might respond to Jesus' question by saying, what I most want is to be reconciled with my father. That might have been his deepest yearning. He goes on to say that when Jesus asked, do you want to get healed, to be healed, he is showing respect for the man. He is asking, he is listening. He's relating to the man as a human being, um, not, um, not relating to him as a, someone who's defined by his disability. He's, and he's inviting him to share, uh, to be a part of the healing. Now, I don't think, um, like I said, we see faith here as we see in other healings, but this was the offer that Jesus gave him. You know, that's how Jesus saved each one of us. There, there's no such thing as a mass salvation. Jesus comes to each one of our situations and dealt with us personally. So a couple takeaways that I have. First of all, be amazed. Be just amazed at how personal Jesus is. He's not pushy. He invites. He asks questions. He works with people, works with us one-on-one. -on -one. And secondly, can we, um, can God ask us that question? Do you want to be healed? Maybe there's an issue in our lives that we secretly like. We, uh, it's a negative thing, but this is something we've grown used to. We want to stay in our mess, in our sin. For instance, like an alcoholic, um, the question, do you want to be healed? Do you want to get better? Do you want to kick this habit? Might be a challenging one. It might require him to go through a lot of pain, to actually deal with the um, pain that he's been avoiding. Um, the alcoholism certainly is working for him, at least in the short term. In the long term, it's killing him. 
but in the short term, it's solving some kind of a problem. So do you want to get well? Do you want to give up the very thing that you're depending on is a challenging question. And to ask shows, I think, like I said, great respect for that man. Um, Jesus asked him if he wants to be healed. Now he might deny he has a problem. He might say, you know, eventually. He might say um, the pain um, and suffering, he might actually see the pain and suffering that he would face if he says yes. Uh, he's got to get up. He's got to carry his mat. He's got to take responsibility for his life. He, I don't know. Um, maybe it's not a physical problem, um, ultimately, that we face. Maybe it's a spiritual problem. Do you want to get well? Do you want to give up that de dependency, that way of life that keeps you enslaved? All of a sudden, um, the question doesn't seem all that crazy, all that, and the answer is not all that obvious. Because there's, there's a part of us that prefers the way we've been living rather than believing that Jesus can heal, rather than face the hard work of recovery. Do you want to get well? It's a question that Jesus asked us when we are feeling like a victim, when we've, be, when we've become used to our sin and our way of life. Do you want to change? Um, did I miss anything, Marsh? Did I? I think so. Okay. She says she okay. said it was good. All right. <laughs> um, another story that dem demonstrates the personal nature of Jesus' healings is in Luke 8, 40. And I'll ask my scripture reader to turn to Luke 8, 40. You need to have some background music playing. Oh, here's the pages going. Yeah. <laughs> 840 uh, 40 to 48. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jarius, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there, who had been sub subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge, the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Thanks, Marsh. Good job. So, um, focusing on this, the story of the woman, um, verse 42, we have these narrow streets. The crowds were there to welcome Jesus and they were just, Scripture says they're almost crushing him. The picture is of just a mass of humanity pressed against Jesus. And in that crowd, this woman who had, been, had a bleeding disease for 12 years. Just think about that. 12 years. Um, loss of blood must have weakened her, uh, made her ceremonial, ceremonially unclean. No church for 12 years couldn't go to the temple. Uh, it makes our co coronavirus quarantine seem like nothing. I mean, could you imagine, um, you know, it's, tw it's your uh, 2020, not being able to go to church until 2032. 12 years is the next time you, your chance of going to church. She also couldn't touch anyone else. That would make them unclean. Uh, she would have been socially distanced for 12 years. Um, in Luke's version, uh, Luke being the doctor, he admits um, this uh, line that comes in Mark. Um, Mark says she had seen many doctors in a vain attempt to heal her. She spent all of her money. She was desperate. So verse 45, who touched me? Well, everyone was touching him, right? 
In Mark 5, 31, it says, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? I mean, they think he's crazy. Um, in the Luke version, they all denied it. And of course, many had touched him inadvertently. They denied touching him on purpose, uh, which I think was the point of this question. They were saying, so many are touching you. How can you even ask that? We have an intriguing detail, by the way, about Jesus. Um, I think this is the only place that you see this in scripture. He felt the power go out of him when he healed. Um, I don't know if you've ever played video games where um, you know, you, you're playing a fighter and uh, he's got a shield or he's got a certain amount of health. And every time he's hit, every time you're hit, um, the, the, the health goes down and down and down. The power is going out. Um, I don't think we want to think about Jesus' uh, power going out like that. Like, who took it? Who, where is, is, it's going to end up on zero. I'm, the, I'm not going to be able to heal anymore. One commentator um, described it as a hose drawing out water in an ocean. Jesus felt the movement of power, but he had an endless supply. You also get the impression that Jesus healed um, somehow involuntarily, um, that she touched Jesus and the power went out of him. Um, we have a mystery here. Um, maybe the best way to think about this is to, th to see the Holy Spirit's role um, in Jesus' miracles and specifically his healings. Um, there's lots of verses to consider, but let's look at Matthew 12 when the Pharisees claimed that Jesus was casting out demons through the power of Satan. Matthew 12, 28 says, uh, Jesus says, but if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. This is where he says that the Pharisees had committed the unpardonable sin by attributing the work of the Spirit to Satan. So here you have the sovereign, all-knowing Holy Spirit seeing this woman's heart, seeing her faith, and healing her. Was Jesus aware of her? Was Jesus aware that I'm going to heal this woman? I don't know. I've been talking to Pastor Mike down the hall uh, about this. Uh, you got the second person of the Trinity seemingly unaware of the of the miracle you have the third person the trinity the holy spirit um performing it uh, then you have jesus seemingly unaware of who the woman was or maybe he was just drawing her out i'm not sure there's enough in the text to explain it uh, and certainly when we uh ever we talk about the holy spirit we have to admit that uh we it's a mystery we can't get to the bottom of it so moving on, verse 47, Jesus wanted to bring her out in the open with this question. He wanted to establish a relationship with her. Notice that she was trembling. Why was she trembling? She was scared to death. Think about that. She might have thought, I've done something wrong. Maybe he's going to take back the cure. Or, or maybe he's just going to be mad that I touched him. And what would people think? I mean, they must realize now that I've touched many of them and made them ceremonially unclean. Maybe she just was in awe of being in the presence of Jesus. Um, some, a few people very helpfully commented uh, when we were going through this with the class that um, maybe she, maybe he just wanted to show everyone that she had been healed and now she can go back to a normal life. I thought that was a really excellent point. But in the midst of this healing, she is found out. She admits that, yeah, she was the one that touched him and she's just trembling. Uh, and look at Jesus' words. Just gentle, loving, calls her daughter, this tender greeting. Um, only record of Jesus using this way to address a woman. And he says, your faith has healed you which suggests to me physical and spiritual healing. So why did Jesus ask who touched me? Um, she had hoped to be healed anonymously, wanted to walk away um, and uh, walk away into the crowd and 
never be seen again, most likely. But he desires a personal relationship with each one of us. He's not impressed with crowds. We're impressed with crowds. In fact, after any church event, the, the, the question always is, well, how many people came? That's success. How many people? Was it more than last time? But Jesus, not impressed with crowds. We see that in scripture. He would be asking how many lives were changed? What are their names? Who's following up with them? That's the question to ask. Um, we judge the worth of something by how many people show up, how many likes, not by um, relationship. You think about social media. Um, how many, how many uh, people liked that post? How many people commented on it? Like, um, that's the best thing in the world. I remember watching a Seinfeld comedy routine one time, and someone in the crowd yells, I love you, Jerry. And, and, and Seinfeld says, I love you, and you love me, and we will never meet. And he had this big smile, like, this is the perfect thing. But that wasn't Jesus. That's not the kind of relationship that Jesus wanted. We have an insight into Jesus here. He loved people, not crowds. And the question is, do we love people with that same kind of attitude? It's a good reminder to me that one person in a crowd matters. Are we concerned about each person that we encounter? It's such a high bar that Jesus set, such an incredible example of how he wants us to love. So think about that. I should mention a few other healings that involve questions by Jesus. Um, I mentioned in Mark 10, the blind man named Bartimaeus who called out Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If you look at that story, it's incredible. Even when the crowd rebuked him, he kept on shouting, um, have mercy on me. And Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? I think in asking that question, Jesus wanted him to verbalize his faith. The blind man answered, Rabbi, I want to see. And Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. Bartimaeus then followed Jesus. Um, the story shows how different Jesus' healings were. They weren't co cookie cutter. Again, he healed individuals and met their needs. Well, let's switch gears here and look at one more question. Jesus asks, how much bread do you have? That's in Mark 6. How much bread do you have? This was in the context of the feeding of the 5,000. The only miracle besides the resurrection that's actually reported in all four Gospels. So we're going to look at the Mark version, Mark 6, verse 31. And Marcia, take us to verse 44, 31 to 44. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me to, by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups of, in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of, a hundred, of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. 
They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. So, verse 31, you have a picture of the disciples in the midst of a very busy day, very busy season. They didn't even have time to eat. Uh, I don't know if I ever want to be that busy. So, Jesus invites them to a time of rest. The people, of course, we know, followed um, and actually beat them to the destination. Um, and in verse 34, it says that Jesus had compassion. How would you react if you were the disciples? Um, you have to think that they were hoping that Jesus would just ignore the crowd. That's what I would have been thinking. Um, I take Fridays off, and honestly, I guard them. I uh, try not to do any work on Friday. Um, Saturdays will come along and I'll work part of the day, whatever, uh, to get ready for Sunday and different things like that. But Friday, that's sacred. So here was the disciples Friday, um, and they were undoubtedly annoyed, even though Jesus was the one who was going to have to do all the work. Now, um, notice the text gives this commentary. Jesus felt compassion. Why? Because they, the people were like sheep without a shepherd. Um, reminds me of a, of a verse in the Old Testament. Um, Moses prayed this in Numbers 27, verses 16 and 17. He says, may the Lord, the, um, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in. So the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. So sheep without a shepherd means there's no leadership. And seeing them as sheep without a shepherd, that was definitely this dig against the Pharisees, because the Pharisees should have been the teachers. They should have been the, uh, the ones who were shepherding the flock. I mean, imagine if someone got up in your church in the middle of a service and said to all the people, you are like a congregation without a pastor. Could you imagine the pastor's kind of going, oh, what about us, right? Um, I wonder if that's how the Pharisees felt. Um, so Jesus began teaching them that's what they needed until late in the day. And in verse 40, 35, the disciples urged Jesus to send people, the people away so they can get somebody to eat. They said, send the people away so they can Get, go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. That was the disciples' plan. But was it practical? I mean, you think about you know, 10,000 people, 5,000 men and women and children, 10,000 people descending to these surrounding towns. One commentator said, you know, the towns around them were like 400, maybe 600 for the bigger one. How in the world would one of those towns ever be able to feed all of these people. No way it could have worked. So Jesus said, good plan, stupid plan. Okay, I added that. Um, but, she said, but Jesus says, you feed them. And they estimate the amount of uh, money it would take to feed everyone, at least eight months wages. Totally impossible. Um, and in verse 38, we have our question. Well, how much bread do you have? How many loaves? How much bread do you have? We'll take a look at that question in just a minute. So verse 39, he had everyone sit down. Um, all ate, all of them ate and were satisfied. Um, in fact, they had 12 basketfuls left over. It's interesting that there were 12 disciples, 12 baskets. They each had a basket. <laughs> um, my guess is that was lunch for the next oh, no, week or so, whatever, how long it ever lasted. Um, it would have been their provision and maybe even a constant provider, a uh, constant reminder that God is um, able to provide for them. Um, it's also interesting that Jesus provides a lavish feast, but um, sorry, he doesn't give us a, a lavish feast, but he gives an abundant meal. He gives plenty of food to eat, but it's not like it's lavish. I mean, it's bread, it's fish, something they eat every day. Um, there's an interesting parallel to the manna that God provided for the Israelites. 
It was called the Bread of Angels, which sounded pretty good. And my guess is the first, I don't know, week, two weeks, month, whatever. I was like, yay, manna, this is pretty good stuff. Um, but eating it every day for what? 40 years. That would have been tough. Um, so of course they complain. Um, we read in Numbers 11, but now we have lost our appetite we never see anything but this manna. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. The Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. Oh my gosh. Those Israelites, huh? It's not, it's not like something we would ever do. <laughs> Complain. Like uh, uh, we would never wail at uh, eating bread every day, but what about wearing masks? Oops. Oh. I'm going to move on. Moving on. Sorry. Um, maybe the disciples uh, had the same thought as they chewed their leftover bread for the next few days. Bread, again. I mean, it's a human reaction. Would have been my reaction. Um, but let's look closer at Jesus' question. How much bread do you have? Disciples, the disciples might have thought that Jesus was just playing with them. I mean, does it matter? Okay, just to prove how ridiculous the question is, maybe, um, let's survey. Oh, great, we got five loaves and two fishes. That's plenty to feed the whole crowd. Um, maybe they turn their pockets inside out. And look, got nothing, nothing else. We got no money. We got no more bread. Five loaves, two fishes. Uh, let's go back to our plan. Send them away. Did they get the point that Jesus can provide? My guess is no. And Matthew and Mark actually tell of a similar miracle. It's another mass feeding, and we know it's, it's another one because there's a different number of people, different number of uh, loaves, and they responded the same way. I could see maybe they didn't get the first time, but the second time, um, this time in Matthew 15 and Mark 8, the story is that there's 4,000 people. Jesus asked the same question, how much bread do you have? And this time, seven loaves and a few fish. Um, so to fail a test the first time is like, okay. We probably would have failed that too. But to fail the same test the second time, that's pretty pathetic. In Copenhaver's book, he makes the point that Jesus was looking for a different answer from the disciples. They gave a literal answer, five loaves, two fish, and he wanted them to answer in faith, knowing that Jesus could provide whatever they had. He could use whatever they had to provide for the crowd, especially the second time. Come on, let's get it. Imagine if the um, disciples had answered with faith rather than frustration. They say, Jesus, we're concerned about this crowd. Send, send them away so they can get something to eat. And Jesus says, well, you feed them. And the disciple, disciples say, well, how can we do that? I mean, even if there was a 24-hour deli uh, in the town next to us, we don't have enough money to pay for it. And Jesus says, well, how much bread do you have? What if the disciples knowing that Jesus um, had calmed the storm, had power over nature, knowing that he had healed the invalid, he had restored sight to the blind, knowing that he was the son of God, the Messiah, who could do anything. What if they had said, you know, we have more than enough bread for you to work with. Man, wouldn't that have been an answer. That would have been like an A plus answer. Um, that would be what Copenhaver um, calls a theology of abundance. Maybe, um, sorry, that when God provides, he provides more than enough. Now, maybe not exactly what we want. Um, he gave manna for 40 years you couldn't store it, right? You had to gather it every day. It reminds us of Jesus' prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Um, but the disciples didn't have that perception. They had a, a theology of scarcity. 
They were pretty sure they didn't have enough. Well, if they were sure they didn't have enough, look, this is all we have. Jesus says, that's plenty. Offer that. So how can we bring this question to bear in our lives? How much bread do you have? The question is, do you have a theology of abundance or do you have a theology of scarcity? Honestly, if we take an inventory of what we have to serve God with, um, we would be embarrassed by our abundance. God has provided more than enough bread and fish. Most of us would have to admit that we've got a nice house, we've got a decent job, we've got money in the bank, we've got plenty of toys. We don't just have an abundance, we have a super abundance, more than enough. In fact, we have so much that we take it for granted. I know, I do, um, and we want to get more. So maybe when we hear Jesus' question, how much bread do we have, do you have, we should respond, we should start with responding with gratitude. God, thank you for what you've provided. Maybe Jesus' question about the bread isn't, for us, isn't about a physical provision. Maybe our theology of scarcity has more to do with time. I have no extra time to serve. Or ability. Oh, there's no way I can do that. For me, when I'm asked to do something that's not right in my comfort zone, I typically look for an excuse as to why I can't do it. I know, I know. I'm probably the only one that has ever done that before, right? Um, I remember a time uh, years ago that um, someone asked um, to me for me to be a part of a parenting Bible study. Uh, I didn't feel like I needed it. My kids were already perfect, you know. But uh, And it was on a Monday night. And that was when Monday night football was the thing. You know, it was busy on Sundays. So Monday night, I just loved that that would be my thing to, to, to do. So I gave the leader that excuse. And he said, isn't your family more important than football? Ouch. <laughs> right? Guilt is a powerful motivator. So I went to the study. Um, and it was a good decision. My kids got even better. and We were better parents. Um, but it just reminds me of the excuses that I get as a pastor when I ask somebody to serve. I'm like, really? That's your excuse? And I'm not, a, I'm not allowed to use guilt. I think it's part of my contract. You know, can't use guilt. Um, but do you hear Jesus' question? How much bread do you have? An answer, not enough. I don't have enough talent. I'm not outgoing enough. I could certainly never speak in public. But Jesus says, just offer it. It'll be enough. I'm not going to call you to something and not equip you to do it. Maybe that's what we don't believe or we doubt. Maybe we don't believe that God's going to equip us. I don't know. Now, there's situations where you say no for legitimate reasons. There's always more need in the world than you can fill. But I wonder if this theology of scarcity can become a habit, a habit of looking at what we don't have, looking for reasons uh, to say no to God rather than looking for reasons to say yes to God. I don't know. Also, we tend to devalue small things. But Jesus exalts small things. Think about uh, the things that he pointed out, that he praised. Um, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the smallest seed there is. Um, look at that woman. She gave everything she had, two pennies. A pinch of yeast um, leavens the whole loaf. These little things. Maybe God values small things so that everyone can have a piece of the action. If he only accepted huge sacrifices and only used super talented people, how many of us would get to be a part of the kingdom? But when he says five loaves, two fishes, I can use that. You get to be a part of the plan. In um, the version in John's gospel, the bread and fish came from a boy. How do you think he felt? Mom, Dad, you'll never guess what happened with my lunch, right? 
God used my food to feed all of these people. In Mark 8, you see uh, Jesus' frustration. So this is a little bit after this miracle. You see Jesus' frustration with his disciples. After the second mass feeding, they all get in the boat. And the disciples realize that they had forgot to bring bread. And Jesus says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. The disciples are hungry. They're in no mood for wordplay. Um, so uh, they, uh, they, they respond, he said this because we don't have any bread. Listen to Jesus' response uh, in, where is it? Mark 8, 17 through 21. I'm going to share this with you. Oh, bear with me just for a second, guys. Mark 8, 17. Aware of the discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still see, do you not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the, the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven pieces for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. And he said to them, do you not still understand? Well, what didn't they understand? I mean, Jesus had given them a front row and two displays of power, divine power, and they're worried about forgetting lunch. I think they didn't understand that the creator of the world, of the universe, of everything was here among them and that nothing was impossible for him. Jesus gives this conclusion. I'm sorry, Copenhaver <laughs> gives this conclusion. My bad. When Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? He is not asking for an inventory of available baked goods. He is asking for an inventory of the heart. You may see a few crumbs. Jesus sees a feast. Jesus questions a challenge to trust his perception more than your own. Isn't that great? Great quote. If we trust our perception we'll have a theology of scarcity. If we trust in God's, we'll have a theology of abundance. So when Jesus asks, how much bread do you have? What's the correct answer? What's the faith-filled answer? One word, enough, or more than enough, right? So two questions to take with you. Do you want to get well? And how much bread do you have? You might use that first question in kind of a specialty situation when you're stuck in sin or a sickness or just in a hole that you've dug for yourself. The first step is yes, I want to get well. Um, I can think of many times that you could use that second question. How much bread do you have? How can the Holy Spirit use that question to stir up within us a faith-filled response. Well, thanks for being part of this class. We appreciate it. Um, we've got two more to come, so hopefully you can join us either in person or we'll try to get the recording done next time. Thanks. We'll see you later. Do you want to say bye, Marshall? <laughs> bye. <laughs>